And at the end of days, as Satan sends to earth the expressions of all mankind's desires in the person of the Antichrist, and I'm not going into a study of the Antichrist, but the Antichrist is going to be the ultimate superman. You know, we've got all these superhero movies. Uh, you know, it's just such a magnet, you know, to have these people with powers. And, and that's all part of the run-up to this. And finally, the ultimate Superman is going to come. Now, I don't know if the Antichrist is going to arrive in Central Park in a UFO. I mean, I wouldn't put it past the devil to do that. You know, I mean, everybody wants an extraterrestrial life form to come. And the devil is the ultimate extraterrestrial life form. And him embodying in a human is, is an expression of that. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying that the devil's going to send a UFO and the Antichrist is going to come out. But that would fit our culture. Because people are looking out there. They, they're, they're wanting something from beyond us to solve our problems. And, and that longing of the earth is what Satan's going to respond to. In a very short time after this, this embodiment of the devil arrives, almost all the earth begins to follow him. And that's the saddest heart of the fallen community of this planet. The, the saddest commentary that, that everyone will make that wrong choice and not seek their creator or nearly everyone. And the Antichrist, like Satan, comes to kill and steal and destroy. And Christ, on the other hand, is the one that offers abundant life. But people reject that. That's what's so amazing. Um, Jesus Christ offers, as I said this morning, absolutely free, absolutely unbelievable forgiveness of past, present, and future sin. And people would rather drown their guilt in, in, in chemicals rather than have it removed. It's kind of like if you have a choice of, of a successful cancer surgery to have all the tumor taken away and you'll have perfect health after that, or just have constant painkillers and, and, and all kinds of stuff like that, and you choose to take the pills and let the cancer grow rather than have it removed. And that's just what's unbelievable about the world. But it's part of the malignity of the human heart because of sin. When you call upon Christ to save you from your sins, God delivers us from the power of darkness and from the eternal damnable lies and brings us into the wonderful kingdom of His Son. You know why? Because we become, when we're saved, lovers of truth. And I want to show you what I mean by turning back with me to 2 Thessalonians 2. This is probably one of the uh, biggest exposés on this, this whole deception that's coming. 2 Thessalonians. So you keep going, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, there it is, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Uh, and we're going to look at 2nd Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 1. Because today, just as during the tribulation years, there will be only two types of people on the planet, truth lovers and truth haters. And, and the truth lovers are those who have received the love of the truth. And that's how Paul describes it. Follow along as, as Paul writes this. He says, Now, brethren, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to soon be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So they were already having eschatological disputes back then. That prophecy was always contested, and people thought they'd missed Christ's return. In Paul's day, someone wrote a spurious letter and, and scared them all. Verse 3 said, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, here it is, unless the falling away comes first. Do you see why? Matthew 24, Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, you know that it's right on the verge. The, the, my coming is, is, is precipitated by, look right here. The falling away comes first. And verse 3 continues, And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. By the way, the Antichrist, the beast, has about 30 different titles given him in the Bible. He is an amazing amalgam of everything, of deception and of manipulation. It's kind of like putting together a warrior that is as invincible as Genghis Khan and someone that's as ruthless as, as Adolf Hitler and someone that is as, as totally uh, maniacal and controlling like Mao over the billion Chinese. And you put him kind of in a winsome, grinning, grandfatherly uh, Ronald Reagan package. And can you imagine what that would be like to just have someone that, who's an incredible communicator 
the Antichrist, it says that, that he has powerful words and, and he has this, this unbelievable military power and he's just a genius. He's just kind of what everybody was waiting for. And he's going to come. He's called the son of perdition. Verse four. But look at the what what he's characterized by. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So he's going to be the ultimate one. Remember, the emperors, the Roman emperors wanted to be worshipped. He's going to want to be worshipped. He's this this magnet for worship so that he sits. Look, at, look what it says in this verse, verse four, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, just look up for a second. Think about that. Do you realize that's what we just read in Matthew 24? Jesus said in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination that causes desolation in the temple, in the holy place, the holy of holies is actually the naos in Greek. We, we know, he actually goes in the holy of holies. Now, wait a minute. Where's the holy of holies? See, there's a real. That's why we have such a division in the church between the amillennialists who spiritualize everything. Because if you really believe the Bible, that's saying that there's going to be a rebuilt temple over there in Israel. Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, "Let those who are in Jerusalem." So we already know that Jesus, in this in this Olivet discourse, as he's on the side of the Mount of Olives, looking into the future, was looking at Jerusalem, and he said, "I see." A temple in Jerusalem, and I see this this man of sin going into that temple and saying, I'm the God you've always wanted to worship. So Jesus saw a Jewish temple in Jerusalem at the end of the world. Guess who else sees it? Right here, Paul is seeing the same thing. Do you see Paul is saying that? He sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul saw it. You know who else saw it? John the Apostle. By the time we get to chapter 13, 11 through 13 of Revelation, 13, the beast is coming. 11, there is a temple built in Jerusalem. It's amazing to think about how we are... Look what's going on right now. I mean, the Jews are fighting for their lives against the Muslims, but something is going to happen. It's going to cause the world to allow them to do something, to put up this holy place, this worship place. Do you not remember, verse 5, that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Paul's writing the Thessalonians. He was only there for a few weeks. Have you ever read the brevity of his time there? Did you know Paul, in this short stop, in this crucial city, church planning, taught them prophecy? You know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, prophecy is not important. You've got to get on the big doctrines, you know. Why did he teach it then? Why did he spend so much time with these new believers? He says, don't you remember I talked to you about all of this? I talked to you about the end of the world. I talked to you about the Antichrist. I talked to you about the great deception. Verse 6, and now you know what is restraining, that, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And by the way, the restrainer is always debated. And, and so it's one of two things. It's either the Holy Spirit in the church or it's the Holy Spirit. But it's probably the Holy Spirit in the church. And the church is removed and the restraining influence and it precipitates, it kicks off, it kind of takes the block out and this, this whole machine starts rolling. So the restrainer, the Holy Spirit is the restrainer, but whether it's him alone or whether him and the church, it's kind of the same thing. But look at this, the, the coming, verse 9, of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. See, he's called the lawless one. Earlier he's called the son of perdition. He's called the beast. He's called the Antichrist. He's called the, a lot of things, especially in the Old Testament prophets. Many titles, the same embodiment. By the way, I think Satan's always had one in every generation. I don't know if you realize that Satan knows this is coming. And I think he's always had someone on deck. I think Hitler was one on deck. I think all the great world leaders were, were energized in some way or another by the devil. And he, he thought it was the time. He thought he was going to take over the world. And he's going to have all that worship because he's so longing for it. And then God says, oh, it's not yet time. And Hitler was defeated by a few 
bad tactical moves or he would have or we would have all been speaking German. You know, he was quite a military man. But keep going. Verse uh, nine continues with all power. Paul's describing this. Satan pulls out all the stop and this leader has all power, signs and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perished. Now, this is the key to this passage in verse 10. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Salvation, genuine saving faith, involves receiving from God a love for the truth. A love for the truth. And that's why I'm deeply concerned. You know why, as old as I am, I stay in college ministry? Because I'm seeing the next generation always before me. And you know what? I just came back from there. Did you know it's a little blur in those collegians' minds? They can't tell whether the Christians, whether it's in the Bible, or whether they read it in Wikipedia, or whether they saw it in a movie, or whether someone Twittered it to them. You know, they don't know. They don't really have their... Their foundation in the Word. See, we're, we're really in a post-Christian society. Uh, even unsaved people knew the Bible. Have you ever read English literature? I mean, gross, unsaved, harlotrous people wrote about the Bible in their literature because it was a Christianized culture. But we're in a time where even Christians don't know the Bible. What concerns me, all pastors, is if born-again people are... Look back at verse 10. Part of the new birth is receiving a love of the truth. And I told the young people yesterday, I said, you know what? I said, if you are a Twitter bug, you know, and you're, you're you know, Twitter, I don't know if you know it. It's a little service that just tells all your friends everything you're doing. You just put a little bit in it, blankets everybody, and you can say, I'm at the, and I've done this, and I saw that, and all this. I said, when I was young, it used to be called frittering your life away, and I think you guys are twittering your lives away. You know, I mean, you're wasting your life. I said, you know the, the whereabouts of every single person that you care about on earth except for one, God. And you haven't even spent time listening to Him. But you'll jump when your electronic device vibrates. God says true believers have a love of the truth. And that's part of our salvation. In verse 11, And for this reason, God will send them, the ones who are not lovers of the truth, strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, verse 12, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, you know the truth, and the truth will set you what? Yeah. You see, there's also a correspondence with the church is is increasingly growing cold because unrighteousness is moving into the church. Do you know why unrighteousness is moving in? Because there's not a passionate love for the truth. If you love the truth, you're being set free from iniquity. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know the truth. You know that God hates sin. In fact, I told you talk about arresting their attention. I said, you know what? Young people. The Bible says that, that all sins are sin, but one class of sins are especially harmful. Now, I'm talking to a group of jiving college kids. I mean, they were jumping during the songs. I mean, I can't jump. In fact, they tried to have me do one thing. I'm not going to do it, but it was terrible. You know, I, I can't even do that. You know, I can't even get, you know, do those things that they do. But I was supposed to because I was a speaker, but I couldn't. But they do it. And I said, you know what, you guys are so full of energy and everything else, but you know what the Bible says? That all sins are outside the body except for one. And all immoral sexual sins are against your body. I said, you live in in this generation where you guys are getting this close. You're you're kind of Clinton-esque. You say, I didn't do it. You do everything else around. You just don't do it. And I said, you are living in immorality, many of you. And you don't realize that God says that if you do that, you're sinning against this body. And this body is going to stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's going to ask you, 
What did you do with that body? And yes, we will be forgiven for all sins. And yes, they're all forgotten. Yes, we're white as snow. But there is a penalty, it says in the Bible. There is a loss that believers will suffer who commit sexual immorality because this body belongs to the Lord. And above all other sins, you know, there's all kinds of bad sins. But Paul says those that commit immorality sin in a very special way against their body. You know, and as I said that, it got absolutely hushed. Because that is such a prevalent struggle in our... All the, the, the barriers have been removed. And I'm not going to speak on, on modesty and immorality tonight, but I am going to say that those who are truly born again in verse 10 receive a love of the truth and they're saved. And that truth causes them in verse 12 to not have pleasure in unrighteousness. And if you're struggling with sin, we all struggle with sin, but if you are unusually struggling with sin, you ought to start doing a high dose of truth. And you will have a longing for righteousness and to be set free. 